Well, between classes, we've been talking about superstitions, but we're, we're going to get back uh, to talking about research uh, and interventions. And we had just completed talking about the, the single case study where you actually you know, measure a problem at, uh, when the person first presents, and then you measure it again, this, measuring the same person several times to see whether or not they improve with your intervention. Now, the next uh, type of study I'm going to talk about is called epidemiological uh, designs. And this is not to deal, at least initially, not to deal with intervention. Rather, here, we're going to observe a particular phenomenon. That is, we're going to look at the problem, and perhaps the problem in a certain context, namely society or our culture, without interfering in any way. Uh, we're not going to try to affect change. We just want to discover what is the prevalence, that is, uh, the number of phenomena at a particular point in time. And, and we may be looking for trying to understand the, the onset of this. Now, why would we want to, to, to study something that we, we're, we're not intervening in? Well, one reason is we, uh, the epidemiological studies help us to identify what problems are out there? Uh, you might want to know something like the suicide rate uh, in a specific population, especially if there is a suspicion that more people in one population are committing suicide than you would have expected. You might first of all want to check out, is your observation correct? Because if you're going to start a suicide prevention effort, you would want to know, uh, in, in this particular community, you'd want to know there, there really is a reason for it. Uh, you might study things like the uh, incidence of teenage smoking. Uh, if you're going to try to create a program uh, to help people overcome smoking, uh, you would certainly want to know like what is the incidence that it exists now, so that if you put in your program, uh, you'll have a, an opportunity to measure did it have any impact. But the the idea of epidemiological designs is simply to understand the population. You're not really going to uh, intervene. And, and what you do, of course, is you often get a number then. You get, that is, you get the number of incidents of some phenomena, like the number of incidents, meaning like how many children uh, under 15 smoke. Uh, and you normally would do that you know, over a specific period of time. So you'd want to know, you know, uh, if you're going to study 15-year-olds, let's say we'll identify them uh, as being in their freshman or sophomore year of high school, you might want to study them from you know, September uh, to January or something like that, see how many cases there are, uh, and then compare that with other national data you have to see, does our school have more of a problem than other schools? And also, just knowing the number of incidents, are there enough people engaged in this activity that we would really want to spend the money uh, to design a plan to intervene. Now next, there are correlational studies. Now in these studies, we attempt to determine the direction and the strength of a relationship between two or more variables. Now, it's very important to be aware that this tells us nothing about causality. That is, because two things highly correlate does not necessarily mean there's any causality between them. Uh, i give you, a, you know, an example. Uh, supposing you did a study and you found that there is a high correlation between movie attendance and high gas prices. Maybe an exceptionally high correlation. Would that mean anything to you? You think that would be helpful information to have? Ah, uh -huh. Mr. Opuni says no, that's not helpful information to have. And I would agree with him. <laughs> it, doesn't, it doesn't tell us anything. <laughs> uh, we just happen to have stumbled onto the fact that when one phenomena occurs, Another one occurs. Uh, but if you think about the phenomena, uh, you know, uh, high gas prices tend to be an acute issue. That is, you know, prices go up, prices go down, prices go up. Uh, you can't suddenly race out and make a bunch of movies <laughs> because 
gas prices have gone up. And, and also, uh, while it may be that there is a truth to the observation, uh, no one would probably think there really is any relationship. That is, that gas prices really have anything to do with whether people go to the movies or not. So you can get high correlations, but they have no meaning. They're not helpful. They don't really tell you anything. So what you're looking for are correlations that actually can be helpful uh, in giving you information. Now these correlations, they can be positive. That is, both variables either increase or decrease at the same rate. Or the, the correlation can be negative. That is, one variable increases while another variable is decreasing. Uh, so for example, uh, you could have a high correlation between access to mental health treatment and decrease in suicide. Now that might be an important correlation. If you provide more mental health services, less people take their lives. In fact, I, I was reminded of, a, when I was going over this, of a woman who wrote me a letter once when I was the chief of psychiatry outpatient services telling me that uh, her son had ended his life. And she was thanking me. It was a very unusual letter. She was thanking me for the fact that at our center, her son had been treated for several years, was schizophrenic, very depressed. And, and he had done well. In fact, he had been able to become uh, independent, living on his own. And so he went off to another state in the Southwest. And she said when he got there, they didn't have mental health services like we had in Illinois. And her son never quite got linked up. So when he got very depressed again, he really couldn't get treatment. He ended up taking his life. And the mother was writing this really amazing letter telling me how much she now understood that the availability of services, how much that meant to someone who was suicidal. So were we to find this, we wouldn't be surprised that if you have more uh, interventions available, probably people will get help. Uh, so that can be helpful. Uh, does that prevent suicide? Well, that's too big a jump uh, because it's not having the services available that prevents it. It's the person actually getting engaged in services and hopefully seeing people who are expert enough to keep them from doing it. But here you have the situation where you have one variable increasing, that is availability of mental health services, and you have another variable decreasing, that is the number of suicides. You also might have uh, a correlational study, well, let's say with stress, where stress increases significantly and continues to increase the more a soldier gets to the front lines. So when the person first arrives, they have moderate stress. They begin to move up, get closer to battle. Their stress increases. By the time they get to the front lines, their stress is very high. Uh, again, we would uh, you know, certainly think that that correlation is very meaningful. Uh, and and, and it, it, it's one, in fact, that you know, just intuitively you would think that happens. Now, you also could have a situation where children's stress in the classroom decreases when the punitive behavior of a teacher towards the students decreases. So here you have two variables that change uh, as each gets lesser. That is, you've got the, the stress in the student goes down as the teacher's punitive behavior goes down. Uh, so, but again, these are, are, are all correlational studies. That is, we, we're finding that there are certain phenomena that might affect other phenomena. And so in, in correlational studies, we don't go so far as to say, this is the cause of this. But we may go so far as to say, if we can influence one variable, it does look like another variable changes. So if we can have a more supportive environment in the classroom, we probably will have less youngsters being stressed. Now, next, we have experimental studies. And of course, you know, psychology has become well known for its experimental studies. And now here, 
we actually control and manipulate what is occurring so we can determine if our intervention is effective. So here we have what are called independent variables and our independent variables let's say could be some form of psychotherapy and we examine the effect of the independent variable on our dependent variables and the dependent variables often might be like the symptoms that the person presents with. So you've got symptoms a person presents with, that's what we're going to try to address and we're going to try to see if our independent variable, that is a, some kind of treatment, actually makes a difference in the dependent variables. Now, the kind of study that is you know, seen kind of as the best study is when you have a population of people and you can randomly ass assign individuals from a large population to various treatments. I mean, that's kind of like the golden way to do the study is you've got lots of people who have a certain problem, you randomly assign them to certain treatments. And, uh, and this is especially important uh, if you have a significant problem and the, la and the population you can work with is large. Now, a good example, actually, a uh, really wonderful example, was the National Institute of Mental Health did a collaborative study on the treatment of depression. And they were able to obtain a large number of people with significant amount of depression. They were able to apply different interventions. And, of course, they were, they were dealing with something people were concerned about. Now, if you look at this design here that we have up before us, what you have is you... you and, and commonly, we separate males and females. I mean, there really are gender differences sometimes in interventions. And so we have our males and females. Then you'll see here we have some only get medication. That's one of our experimental groups. Then we have a second group. Uh, they get behavior therapy, cognitive behavior therapy. That's all that they get. And then we have a group that gets both. So we want to see. Uh, is it more powerful to get cognitive behavioral therapy and drugs? And then we have randomly assigned people to a waiting list. So they're not going to get any intervention right now. They'll get an intervention later. And then you conduct your treatment, and then you wait to see, uh, you know, what happens in this. Now, in a good study, uh, well, let's say in all studies, you know, most of the time when we do studies, we actually think we know what's going to happen. That is, there's, there's a sense we should do the study because it hasn't been done, but we know what's going to happen. Surprisingly, though, studies don't always turn out the way you think. In this study, for example, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy was found to be a very effective intervention with depression. Uh, drug intervention was also found to be uh, effective, not as if but not as effective in the long term as cognitive behavior therapy. But the surprise in this particular study was when you use both, there didn't seem to be any effect. That is, if you got them both, you didn't do any better than if you just got cognitive behavior therapy. There wasn't an additive improvement because you were also getting these drugs. And the people who got treatment did significantly better than people who were on the wait list. So, in, in, in this kind of a design, you've got things uh, nicely controlled, and you're trying to, uh, you know, to determine, uh, you know, what intervention might be best. Now, this study also, uh, you know, presents problems to uh, people. And in a moment, I'll talk about, uh, you know, insurance companies. Insurance companies obviously wanted this study to come out so that the drug group did wonderfully. The ther that therapy added nothing. And that the way to deal with depression is simply drug people. So when the study came out this way, this was not something that obviously would be pleasing to, to drug companies. Now, in, in insurance companies also become a problem. I conducted a study uh, that had some similar elements to this. It was, uh, we were trying to determine whether or not seriously mentally ill people when they became acutely psychotic, really needed to be in a hospital. And one of our uh, hypotheses was that when somebody who is very vulnerable uh, becomes acutely psychotic, they need 24-hour care. But the question is, do they need it in a hospital? 
So I got funding from the National Institute of Mental Health, and, and I rented a, a, uh, the second floor of a low-cost hotel about two blocks from the hospital. And then I gave instructions to everybody in the emergency room that when a decision was made in the emergency room that a person needed to be hospitalized immediately, we would ask them if they would participate in the study. Just about everybody agreed to participate in the study. And we randomly assigned half the people to this hotel that I had set up. And I, and I had taken over the whole second floor of the hotel. And I had uh, social workers and mental health workers over there uh, 24 hours a day. So there was crisis intervention therapy always possible. And the other half the people we, we put in the hospital. And the only people we excluded in this particular study were people who actually had a medical reason for coming in the hospital, that they, there was some other additional reason why they needed to be in the hospital. But we randomly assigned people who were suicidal or people who were homicidal, people who were terribly delusional or hallucinatory to our hotel program. And what we found uh, after a couple of years, we ran the program for a couple of years, what we found was that there was no difference between putting someone in our hotel program where they, they went to the hotel, they had 24-hour care. During the day, they came back to the mental health center and they got psychotherapy, they got medication. Uh, maybe some of them would participate in the day hospital. Uh, but we found that that program of putting the people over in the hotel was just as effective as putting the people in the hospital. Now, by the way, this, this hospital uh, you know, was an elite hospital, uh, you know, one of the nicest hospitals you would ever want to be in. And, and thus, this hospital cost three times as much as it cost to put the person in the hotel. And we also did a, uh, a patient satisfaction uh, study to see, you know, where would the patients like to be? And overwhelmingly, the patients preferred to go to the hotel. So we ended up in the situation where we had two treatments that were probably of equal value. That is, uh, and in fact, it turned out to be the people who went to the hotel actually spent about two days less than those people going to the hospital, but, but pretty close. So you have two treatments of equal value, and you have, you're dealing with a very serious problem. I mean, the average patient in our study had previously been psychiatrically hospitalized seven times. So we're, we're talking about people who are, have a lifelong disorder, much difficulty, uh, and dealing with their psychosis. So we've got a serious patient population. We've got two treatments that work. And we've got one that costs three times as much as the other. Now, when I tried to get insurance companies to pay for my program over in the hotel, they refused. They were worried that somehow their costs would go up even though I pointed out to them that, you know, if you just look at the data, your costs will go down. But they became concerned, well, maybe, maybe we'll start sending people to the hotel who we really wouldn't have hospitalized anyway. So maybe we're going to create a new population. The outcome, thus, in this study, and this is where, you know, you can do a very good study and you still don't get to where you would want to get. After showing that we could cut the, the costs to insurance companies to a third of what they were now paying, they refused to do it, and they continued to pay for anybody we put in the hospital. So anybody who came with insurance, we put in the hospital because it would cost them nothing. And, and of course, we would collect. Although the belief of all of this was it was far better to put people in the hotel program because it was closer to reality. Uh, it was more like what their, their regular life is. They preferred that program, and, and it was a, a very effective program. So, you know, when you, you do, uh, you know, experimental research, sometimes you get excellent results, only to find out that the real world can't cope with your results or won't cope uh, with your results. Now, there are also important, uh, you know, practical and, and even ethical uh, issues you have to consider in research. Uh, one is, maybe people will get worse. And uh, the most common one is that there are negative side effects. Uh, with drugs especially, 
Uh, there are antipsychotic drugs that are, have been shown to be very effective. I mean, they really help people who are suffering to get over being delusional. They stop having hallucinations. Uh, they're better able to relate to their peers. Uh, they can function in society, et cetera. But uh, many people who are, are really you know, seriously mentally ill for a long time and therefore have to take the drugs for a long time develop side effects that are not desirable. Uh, one of them being tardive dyskinesia. Anyone here familiar with what tardive dyskinesia is? Okay, you've heard of it, but you don't remember it. Well, what happens is uh, it, it, one symptom is it affects the tongue of a person so that they, they begin slurring words. Uh, they, they, they don't have the same control uh, that they had. It may affect other parts of the body where the person loses some control. Uh, and we've now, since we've discovered this, there have been other drugs that have been developed that can offset some of these symptoms. But initially, when the studies were being done by various psychiatrists throughout the country, their, their, the purpose of the drug was to alleviate psychosis. What they were able to show is that drugs actually were quite effective in alleviating psychosis. But surprising, uh, we found out that we also are creating a problem. And so then there was a need for more studies to find out some way to alleviate the problem of the psychosis. There are other issues that come in. One is the cost effectiveness of various treatments. Uh, we know that for some uh, you know, very difficult disorders where people are really troubled, especially see this amongst some adolescents, you may have to hospitalize someone for a long time. More and more, our society is unwilling to pay for that. So if you have a vulnerable adolescent, uh, the adolescent may not get the treatment that he or she needs because the family can't afford it and the insurance companies have kind of arbitrarily decided not to, uh, not to fund this. And I, I can even give you a, another personal example, but I was, I was very struck by this. At the time I was a dean, there was a person who, who had uh, in the university who had a child who was adolescent, very, very aggressive, very had a psychosis that got acted out by hitting and hurting other people in the family. Kid was a big kid. And so uh, the family hospitalized uh, and, uh, the person, and it was at a hospital where I, I knew the chief of psychiatry quite well. And, uh, and so the, the youngster stayed there for a while, and he was improving, but not enough that it was safe for him to go home. And the parent came to me at that time because she knew of my background and said, the hospital has informed me that they're going to release my son and I don't think he's ready. So I called the, the head of psychiatry and I said, uh, you, know, do you, you know this person? He says, oh, I know, I know this patient very well. And I said, well, it sounds like this person is, is really troubled. He said, oh, he said, this youngster is. This youngster really needs to be hospitalized. I said, well, I'm glad to hear that. I said, because you know, the family is worried that you were going to let him out of the hospital. He said, we are going to let him out of the hospital. I said, I thought you just told me that, you know, it's clear to you he needs to be hospitalized. He says, you're right. And I said, in fact, I know that this family has three insurance policies. And he said, that's right. That's why the child's been in the hospital this long. But they've used up all three insurance policies. And I said, if they've used up all three insurance policies, they've given you a ton of money. He said, oh, they have. And uh, I said, well, then why don't you just keep them? And he said, well, you don't realize how things have changed since you were chief of service and what it's like now. He said, I am not allowed to keep anybody who can't pay. Whereas when I had been doing these kinds of things, you could always keep people. I mean, you had tremendous power. But he was saying to me that it's just automatic. The, the hospital doesn't do free care. And so this person will have to leave. So now what happened in this particular case is uh, this psychiatrist was such a responsible person. He actually got the person into an experimental treatment program at the National Institutes of Health. And the youngster had to go from the state he was in to Washington, which was a couple thousand miles, uh, to be in treatment. But it was worked out. But I was struck by the fact that, you know, uh, how the world changes, that uh, hospitals uh, and if you talk with anybody in the mental health field, they'll tell you all kinds of stories like this, that, you know, we have interventions that will work, but in some cases, 
the interventions take a lot of time. They take a lot of money. Our society is setting, that is in, in the form of insurance companies, is setting limits. Now what happens with, uh, in, in many acute uh, care facilities, that is general hospitals that have psychiatric units, is after the person is treated for a certain number of days and insurance runs out, they send them to the state hospital. But the state hospital rarely has the kinds of quality programs that you would find in, in an acute, you know, big psychiatric facility or big general hospital with a psychiatric unit. So when it looks like on the surface you're sending the person from one hospital to another so this individual will still be in the hospital. But that's not true. You're sending the person perhaps from a very good treatment program to a hospital that has much less funding and much less resources and where treatment really won't be available. So cost effectiveness has become an issue and, and cost effectiveness is a variable that gets looked at in treatments. Uh, and, and more and more we have economists on, uh, on investigations of psychological uh, you know, interventions because we need people to cost out what really will be the expense of having this treatment. Then there's the generalizability of an intervention. If you find an intervention works with a, a, a very small number of people uh, and it doesn't seem to generalize to other populations, then what you have found is, you know, you do have a treatment for something that doesn't occur very often, but it's not something that you really could use for a lot of other uh, problems. Another thing we are, we are now looking at more seriously is how lasting is a treatment? That is, when the person seems to have gotten better, how long do they continue to be well after the treatment is over? Uh, and we're finding uh, with some treatments, and this is unfortunately particularly with treatments uh, with drugs, is that sometimes the drugs are really very good, but the person uh, who has a quick recovery uh, from some powerful drugs while they're in the hospital, once they leave the hospital and if they stop taking the drugs, uh, they relapse very quickly. So that becomes important in terms of our understanding. Uh, is our intervention going to be somewhat of a cure or is our intervention simply to help someone in an acute state, but uh, we really can't count on the fact that they'll stay well. Then of course, uh, we've talked about this before, there are placebo effects. And the, uh, the placebo effects uh, you know, are important because they're the things that cause people to change. They're not part of the treatment. I mean, just, you know, it may be personal motivation, maybe time away from the family. Uh, it, it may be just a lack of stress in the person's life. But whatever uh, nonspecific factors help a person to get better, are important to know because uh, you have to, uh, you know, to study those to know then what is the, what the intervention you're studying really does. Now next, we have clinical trials. Anybody know what clinical trials are? There's something you're... Well, clinical trials uh, are really one of the most highly reliable forms of study because they, they, they involve investigations that study, where the study is conducted in a number of settings. And you have a number of different treatment personnel. And also you have control groups. Uh, the study that I just showed you a moment ago, the National Institute of Mental Health uh, study on the treatment of depression is really an excellent example. In fact, if we just go back to that, you, if you recall the study as I explained it to you, what I didn't mention in this is that the, these, this study was not being done just at one place, but you had this being done at several centers throughout the country. So you could then compare and see uh, no matter who was doing the treatment or no matter what setting this was in, did it turn out that cognitive behavioral therapy really is a good intervention? I mean, it works in lots of places. Uh, and was it true that in all the places, uh, if you add drugs to this, it really didn't help that much? So th that, that's important. So, so clinical trials then uh, can make a huge difference. And, and the, the idea, uh, if you think about it, of course, is that it's very expensive. 
if you're going to do clinical trials, you know, you're going to, you want large populations of people. You want to do it in several settings. You want to have the same controls in each setting. So you've got to have, uh, you know, highly motivated personnel running the studies. You've got to have a large population of patients. You have to have a large population of treaters. And then you've got research personnel. So clinical trials, well, uh, probably being the, the really most highly desired kind of study, that is an experimental study in several places, is also one that's very, very costly. Now, I want to take you back and talk a bit about the effectiveness of individual psychotherapy. You know, a lot of debate started around the 1950s when a British psychologist named Hans Eysenck reviewed several experiments. And he concluded that the recovery rate for parents, uh, for, for parents, for patients, in individual therapy is not much different than those who don't get any therapy. So he began to say that there really isn't a reason to do psychotherapy. I mean, if you don't do anything for the people, they'll probably get better at the same rate. Now since then, many studies have been done to show that psychotherapy uh, really does have positive results. As most of the studies that have been done where, where the right controls existed have shown, psychotherapy will make a difference. You will do better in psychotherapy than if we don't give you any treatment. What's been less clear is what are the elements in psychotherapy that actually make a difference? Uh, so until recently, we, we have not demonstrated that the type of psychotherapy is, is of importance. And in some of the things I'm going to talk with you about, you'll find that the type doesn't seem to be important, and in other cases, it is important. Now also, we have not demonstrated that more experienced therapists are likely to have better outcomes with clients than a student therapist. That is until recently we haven't. We, we, we have demonstrated that, but for a long time, uh, one of the arguments against therapy was if you do research studies and you use students as the therapist, you tend to get the same results as if you used uh, experienced people. And it took much more sophisticated studies to show that's not true. There is some evidence that cognitive behavioral therapy is more effective than a number of other therapies, but this finding is, is much more complex than it's usually presented. Psychologists will tell you this who are especially interested in research, that cognitive behavioral therapy has been shown to be more effective. Uh, and unfortunately, what people will then present is it is especially effective with phobias, and that uh, cognitive behavioral therapy is a very effective intervention uh, for phobias. Now, the phobias in too many of the studies are things like People complain of being phobic for snakes. Not only do people complain of being phobic for snakes, but you know, uh, the the psychologist, especially if it's a very academically based psychologist, uh, a number of people went out and they asked students, you know, who feels that he or she is is really frightened uh, of something, and they came up with snakes. And so they got a group of students and they. Uh, exposed them to uh, different kinds of interventions, and they found out that those who were exposed to cognitive behavioral therapy got over their phobia. Well, this is not exactly the real world of mental health. I mean, I can tell you as someone who ran a large mental health system for many years, no one ever presented as having a snake phobia. I mean, this was in the downtown area of Chicago. I mean, nobody had seen a snake in years. And, and one of the, the unfortunate things that happened in early in, in doing research in, uh, in some forms of, of psychotherapy that psychologists favored was that they, they were so focused on research design, they lost track of the fact that in order to, uh, to control all the variables they wanted to control, like one symptom, a phobia, one kind of phobia, snake phobia, uh, a population of similar people, college students, that they ended up developing evidence that they had found a treatment to treat something that nobody sought treatment for. 
And then they wanted to generalize this treatment to say it is a superior treatment. Well, these research studies, uh, in, in my estimation, did not demonstrate this is a superior treatment. And also, it was totally devoid of real life. And in a moment, I'm going to show you some of the differences uh, when you deal with real life. Now, also, well, we've had studies m more recently that show that it, it appears the benefits of psychotherapy begin to appear after about the first six to eight sessions. And that 75% of people who show improvement will typically do so by the 26th session. Now, it certainly has been shown that, that people benefit uh, in longer term therapy. But if you're, if you're measuring the increase in, in benefit, it slows down significantly after 26 sessions. So, and that again becomes an issue uh, as insurance companies and you know, third party payers look at it because then they begin to say, why should we pay for any more sessions? Most of the benefit has been attained by the time you get to 26. Of course, lots of, uh, of insurances don't want you to get anywhere near that number. We also uh, have studies now, and this is really important, that show that the benefits of psychotherapy are maintained often uh, for at least six to 18 months uh, after the person stops. So you don't, uh, one thing about psychotherapy is if it's been effective, uh, you don't have a relapse the following month, you know, when the person goes out of therapy, actually that they stay functioning well for a long time. Now, I'm going to, uh, I, I want to tell you about a very uh, special kind of study. It's a very unusual study. It was done by Consumer Reports. And they did a study on the effectiveness of psychotherapy, but, but very different than the ones we're accustomed to. Uh, and I just want to have to make a shift here. Now, in the Consumer Reports study, why this, I would report this study to you, and, and it, it's in your book, is that it, it, it's a, it was done uh, in 1995, it's not that old, but uh, it was reported uh, in a, a very major journal. It was reported in the American Psychologist, which is the, the official journal of the American Psychological Association, and uh, it was reported by uh, Martin Seligman, who, it has recently been the president of the American Psychological Association. And if you remember, he is the person we talked about who was the proponent of positive psychology. And he was a consultant in this study. And, and he really does a, an excellent job of explaining the importance of the study. Uh, and, and why he thought the study was important was because he felt it studied the phenomenon of psychotherapy as it really occurs. Now, as I already, you know, critiqued some studies about phobias, uh, you, know, you know, in those studies, I mean, we studied phenomena that nobody presents. And we often studied uh, college students who already are pretty psychologically healthy. And in fact, in some of these studies, you had to present not only that you were frightened of snakes, but you didn't have any other significant problem. Uh, what the consumer reports, and, and, and Seligman was very critical of those kinds of things and said, you know, the, the plus in the consumer report study is that it actually is just trying to study people as they really experience therapy. Now, this is very much in contrast to what we call efficacy studies. Uh, in efficacy studies, uh, individuals are assigned either to a treatment condition or to no treatment. Uh, and Therapists frequently use manuals in uh, efficacy studies. That is, the therapist is told there are certain things there to do in a progressive way with the patient. Uh, and also, patients are often measured on a single variable, which might be a, a specific problem. The truth is, rarely does a patient come for psychotherapy with a specific problem and then work on that problem for the whole time they're in therapy. That's a very unusual phenomena. So the very way in which we have organized some of our studies is at odds with the way in which real life operates. So what did Consumer Reports find? Well, it concluded, first of all, 
that patients benefited very substantially from psychotherapy. I mean, that was one of their outcomes. And that long-term treatment did considerably better than short-term treatment. And that psychotherapy alone did not differ in effectiveness from medication plus psychotherapy. And again, that another surprising uh, finding. Also, that no specific modality of psychotherapy did better than any other for any disorder. So while overall psychotherapy was effective, this study did not show that there's one kind of psychotherapy quite superior to another. Also, this study showed that psychologists, psychiatrists, and social workers did not differ in their effectiveness as treaters. So if you chose a social worker, chose a psychiatrist, chose a psychologist, didn't seem to make any difference. However, they did find it did make a difference between choosing one of those and choosing a marital counselor or choosing a family physician doing long-term uh, therapy. That there were significant differences between the, the three professionally trained groups and perhaps the, the somewhat less trained marriage counselors uh, and, uh, and, and family physicians. Also, they found that patients whose length of therapy or choice of therapist was limited by insurance or managed care did worse. So if the patient wasn't free to choose a kind of therapy and to choose a therapist, they did less well than those who could choose. Now, you can contrast this consumer report study with more traditional psychotherapy studies because it really is different. Uh, the more traditional studies have shown that cognitive therapy, interpersonal therapy, and medications all provide moderate relief from unipolar depressive disorders. That's a good finding, by the way. You know that, I mean, unipolar depressive disorder is a very serious disorder, and here you're able to uh, find that cognitive therapy, interpersonal therapy, and medication are all helpful in the treatment of this disorder. And there are other studies that show that exposure and clomipramine both relieve the symptoms of obsessive compulsive disorder moderately well. However, they found that if you have exposure is the treatment, uh, it's more lasting. Exposure, by the way, is when you, one of the, the methods is you really try to get the person to either experience in fantasy or else you take them in real life to whatever is the feared uh, place or the feared experience and, and let them actually experience it and you find that, they're, uh, that they decrease in their fear of it. They, studies have shown us that cognitive behavior therapy works well in panic disorders. It's a very important finding and, and very important uh, you know, to point out that you would want to use cognitive behavioral therapy if you had this kind of patient. Also, we know that systematic desensitization relieves specific phobias. Uh, I gave you the worst examples before, of course, of phobias that you know, nobody really is concerned about. There are some phobias that really are clinically relevant, and systematic desensitization has helped us. We also know that transcendental meditation relieves anxiety. Uh, psychologists, psychiatrists, social workers, et cetera, don't talk about that a lot, but the truth is that transcendental meditation has been shown to be an effective intervention. I've mentioned this here before, and that is aversion therapy produces only marginal improvement with sexual offenders. It actually doesn't produce much change at all with most people. And we know from research that disulfiram, which is more commonly called antabuse, does not provide lasting relief from alcoholism, and we've actually known that for a long time. We also know that flooding plus medication does better in the treatment of agoraphobia, which is a fear of being out in crowds, than either alone. So when you're talking about this kind of clinical problem, here is where a psychological intervention and medication is a better intervention 
than if you use just one of them alone. And we have also have learned from studies that cognitive behavioral therapy provides significant relief of bulimia, uh, outperforming medication alone. That's something we've known for a long time. But what's important in this is that cognitive behavior therapy is the preferred treatment uh, in this case. Now let me tell you just a little bit about this study. Uh, this, what Consumer Reports does every year, they have about 180,000 readers. And they send out a survey to their readers. And so they, they get back uh, responses from about 22,000 people. So a lot of people respond. And, and they, had, they were looking for other things besides mental health. But in the mental health part of their uh, survey, they had about 7,000 people responded. And of those people, about 4,100 had been to see some kind of mental health professional. And uh, of the 4,100, 37% uh, of the people saw a psychologist, 22% um, saw a psychiatrist, 14% saw a social worker, 9% saw a, a marriage counselor, and then other kinds of interveners made up about 18%. Now, the reason why uh, Seligman wrote this article and why he uh, was so high on it was that he wanted to get across that this is one of the few studies where you're actually measuring or attempting to measure the effectiveness of psychological intervention in the real world. That is, these people discovered they had a problem. They went out and they sought psychotherapy. Uh, they were not bound by limits uh, of how many sessions are they going to be in. Uh, they, they didn't have to present a specific problem like I am phobic for this or I'm depressed about this or I have a marital conflict. It was whatever their problems were, they were treated. And we get this very naturalistic uh, report from them about what helped and about what didn't help. And, uh, and while this uh, study has been attacked by lots of people, and there, there are good reasons and you can't attack it, but it's one of the few we have where we have a huge population, a naturalistic observation, and we find out that these people are very pleased. And, and the variables that came out in the study were very positive about what psychotherapy really does for people. Okay, we'll stop there for today. Oh.